Hello again everyone and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today I'm coming to you once again from Hino Kicho Park. I haven't been to this park in a little while. I've usually been going uh, either to Aoyama Park which is uh, closer to where I live or shooting from inside but today is such a beautiful day and it's a really nice day to come over to one of the more beautiful parks in the area. The park is quite busy today because it's around lunchtime and we have a lot of uh, office workers and such who are coming here to enjoy their lunch. And also, uh, we have a lot of foreign tourists who are coming. And uh, this is something which I haven't seen in a couple of years. Uh, Japan recently reopened the country to uh, international tourism and the floodgates have opened and lots of people are coming. Uh, I really recommend to those of you who are looking for an interesting place to come on your vacation to come to Japan. Uh, and I recommend this for a few reasons. First, uh, Japan is a very beautiful and interesting place to visit. Uh, the food is good, the scenery is good. There's a lot of culture and history which you can enjoy during your visit. Uh, second, it's a very safe place. You don't have to worry about pickpockets or muggings or, or random violence or things like that. Uh, you don't have to hide your money in a money belt or inside your clothes when you go out walking in the streets. And lastly, uh, right now it's a very good value. Uh, there was a time when uh, if you would have asked me if Japan was a reasonable place to come on a vacation I would have laughed. but. Uh, now it happens to be true and for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that inflation is still kind of normal here in Japan, hovering at around 2% or a little bit uh, less and uh, also uh, the yen, despite the fact that uh, uh, inflation is really low, the yen has become really weak and is trading at close to 150 to the dollar, uh, which means that you can buy about uh, uh, a lot more here than you could buy just last year or a couple of years ago and compared to 10 years ago when it was more like uh, uh, 70 into the dollar it was very expensive to come to Japan so right now it's a great place to come and shop and look around and eat and whatever uh, a much better deal than you'll find in most other places so when you add like the the beauty the culture the scenery the safety and the fact that it's uh, less expensive on top of all that it's really hard to beat coming to uh, Japan. So if you get a chance and you want to travel, uh, uh, please come here. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started with the subject of today's video. And I'm going to be talking today about a Beautyflex camera. Now the Beautyflex uh, company made, or Beauty Camera Company, it's not, they made more than just the Beautyflex camera, was quite popular in Japan in the 1950s. And they produced a variety of 35 millimeter and twin lens reflex cameras. Uh, they weren't a, a very successful company in relation to some of the larger makers around at the time. Uh, their 35mm uh, cameras featured wonderful lenses, but uh, in order, I guess, to compensate for the cost of the uh, better lenses, they were a little bit uh, less careful with the, the quality of the material and workmanship, and, uh, and, and the company kind of disappeared uh, in the 1960s. Uh, the twin lens reflex cameras of the 1950s were remarkably high quality uh, and pretty much uh, every bit as good as the other makers uh, which were popular at the time. Uh, these being of course like Yashica, Minolta, Rico and such. This particular camera which I'm holding is a Beautyflex D which is probably the best all around of the cameras. Uh, it has the best shutter, it has a good lens, it has a lot of features which make it a very competitive camera with the other cameras on the market at the time in addition to being an attractive and well-styled camera. Uh, the Beautyflex D, I think this dates to around 1956 or so, is a really high quality camera which shoots in the 6x6 centimeter format and uses 120 roll film, which you can still easily find today. It features an 80mm f3.5 BioCore lens, and this is similar to the BioCore lenses which they fitted in they're uh, 35 millimeter cameras, of course, uh, yeah, not a, not the same design, but they use the same name and probably a spinoff on the Biometar lenses made by Carl Zeiss for some of their Rolleiflex cameras, which were on the market in the 1950s. Uh, regardless of the name, it's a, it's a really high quality lens and it makes this camera a very good optical performer. It can take really good pictures. Uh, the taking lens on the top, and of course the twin lens reflex camera has two lenses. This is a tri lens, which is pretty much the standard lens which you find on a lot of cameras of the era. You'll see these also on the Yashica and other kinds of cameras uh, from the mid-1950s. So let's go ahead and take a look, a more detailed look at this camera, and we'll go ahead and start at the top here. On the top here we have Beauty KK, which uh, 
uh, means uh, beauty, kabushiki, kaisha. Kabushiki, kaisha generally just means registered company in Japan. Uh, and you'll see KK next to a lot of uh, companies here, uh, company names and whatnot. You pop it open like this, just like any other twin lens reflex camera. And you can see the focusing screen on the inside. It has lines on the top and bottom to help you, uh, I guess, compose and uh, orient the camera when you're shooting. Uh, it takes a little bit of practice when you first use a twin lens reflex camera because though when you move the camera up and down, the image in the focus screen moves up and down. But uh, when you turn the camera side to side or move it, it the, the image tends to move opposite or in unexpected ways. So it takes a little bit of practice to use it. To make it easier, uh, this camera features a uh, focusing loop or magnifying loop. Of course, all cameras, uh, twin lens reflex cameras, come with the, this kind of system to help you focus. Uh, this one here seems a little bit larger than what I usually see in these cameras, and that might make it a little bit easier to use. Uh, this camera also fe features a sports finder, which means you simply fold down this door, and using this small square in the back, you line it up so it's centered in the big square in the front, and this way you can shoot at moving or running objects at infinity, which makes this camera uh, fairly good for things like uh, say uh, photographing boats and things out on the ocean where you all you do is just have to focus it out to infinity and then you know Set whatever exposure is necessary for the light uh, It's also good for um, Sports which are not too close to you for example, you know football baseball or things like that You know if you're like most of us and you can't get a seat right next to the action Probably pretty much gonna have to focus your camera at infinity and it, it works really good in that situation uh, to release the uh, sports finder just push the button on the back and you'll see it's closed like so fold down the, the magnifier always do that a lot of people tend to forget to do that and then they close the the top and they can bend the magnifier which can cause other issues on this style twin lens reflex camera uh, usually doesn't make any difference you can catch it right away but on uh, the simpler ones like the old Ricoh flexes you can actually damage it so always be careful to make sure you push the magnifying lens down before you close the top on the left side here, we have a shoe for mounting a flash gun. And of course, uh, it's a cold shoe on a twin lens reflex camera, but uh, we have a flash sync socket located on the front. So you can just plug in your flash. You can use a modern flash on this camera or you can use a vintage bulb flash, uh, whatever you like. If you're into flash photography, uh, this camera can handle it. We have the typical uh, uh, release pins here, which you use to remove and replace the film or film spools. These are like the Ricoh Flex, which uh, pop down automatically, and not like the Yashica or Mamiya, which lock open. Uh, so you'll have to hold them open when you're loading the film. Uh, not a big deal. On the other side here, we have the film winding knob, and we have the film counter here. So when you're winding the knob, you can just uh, watch the film counter move, and it moves from number to number. And is it when it comes to a stop, when it reaches the first number, it'll stop turning, press the button, that will unlock the winding mechanism and you can move to the next one. Over here we have the focusing knob and we have an indicator dial on the side here, which is a, a nice feature which not a lot of cameras from this era have. <clears throat> and this allows you to uh, program a reminder for what kind of film you have loaded in the camera, if it's black and white or color or what speed. Uh, as I said, a lot of cameras, uh, Yashikas and other ones, though they were very high quality cameras, many of them didn't come with this extra feature, so it's kind of nice to have. Uh, here we have the focusing scale, which on this camera is arranged in meters. And we have a depth of field scale, which will let you know how much depth of field you have at any given aperture. Uh, one weakness in these cameras and something to look for when you're shopping for them, make sure that the focusing knob isn't too difficult to turn. It should be, there should be some resistance to it, uh, enough to where you can't easily push or pull out the front of the, uh, the front standard of the camera or accidentally bump it out of focus. It should be a little bit firm, but not too tight. Uh, a problem which some of these cameras have is the focus helicoids get stuck and that you can't focus the camera easily or at all. And sometimes if you try, uh, you break loose the focusing knob. So keep an eye open on the focusing knob if you're looking for one of these. On the front of the camera, we have the taking lens on the bottom, the viewing lens on the top, the flash sync socket. We have a selector here for uh, uh, when you're using a flash, we have an X sync or M settings. On this side here, we have the aperture ring. Uh, we have, of course, a, a range of apertures from f3.5 up to f22. 
On this side here, we have the shutter speed selecting ring. And as this is a, a nice copal shutter, we have a full range of speeds from a bulb and one second up to one three hundredth of a second. Here we have the shutter charging lever. Uh, you will turn this, uh, pull this downward to lock the shutter. Then here we have the shutter release button. You just press the button to fire the shutter. On this side here, we have a self timer. And as I always say with these old cameras, uh, avoid using the self timer because it is the weak link in the camera. These can fail at any time. And uh, when they fail, you either have to force them, push them to the end of their travel so the shutter will start working again, or replace them, or simply not use the camera anymore. So uh, a word of advice, try not to use these timers if, if, you, can, if you can possibly avoid it. The bottom of the camera here, we have a quarter inch tripod socket and we have the release knob which unlocks the film, the latch, which unlocks the film door and you can open it like so. And here we have the inside of the camera. Uh, if you are loading film in the camera, you would take your full roll of film and put it in the bottom and you would pull out the charging, or not charging, but the, the locking pin here, put in your film roll and let it snap into place. You might have to wiggle the film around a little bit for it to find to get centered and lock fully into place. When it is locked fully into the place, you simply pull the paper backing uh, over the rollers uh, toward uh, the take-up spool. Uh, make sure that when you're pulling the paper backing, you are seeing the colored part of the paper, not the black part of the paper. If you're only seeing black, it means you have the film in backwards or upside down. That's very easy to do, and depending on what camera you have, some cameras require that you load it upside down. Uh, cameras like this, of course, you have to load it where the colored paper is facing toward you. So uh, pull the paper, feed it into the take-up spool, and as I've said in previous videos, I always hold down the paper and I turn like this with my finger, this finger holding the paper down and my finger and thumb turning uh, the winding dial. I do that for a couple of turns to make sure that it's actually winding and caught on the spool because sometimes it will pop back out and you'll just keep winding and winding but the film doesn't wind. So keep turning and turning until the arrows, there are alignment arrows on the back of the film, line up with these two red arrows. You can see them right here. When they are lined up, simply close the film door, lock it, make sure it's fully locked, and then simply wind and wind and wind and wind until the number one shows up in the film counter. And when you want to take a picture, the first thing you need to do is set your exposure. So using a light meter or a light meter app from your smartphone, you program the film speed in your smartphone or light meter that you have loaded in the camera. Uh, you will go ahead and set the aperture. So say for today I would set it to say maybe 125th of a second at f8. That's about good for the light today if I'm using something like 400 speed film. So uh, the exposure is set. I'll go ahead and uh, open uh, the focusing hood and I'll pop open the focusing magnifier. I'll go ahead and charge the shutter. Then I will uh, compose and focus. And when everything is just right, I just depress the shutter like so. And then for the next shot, depress the button, wind to number two, charge the shutter again, and then take another photograph. If the light changes, of course, you'll have to uh, change the shutter or aperture speed. Not a big deal but not that, very di not that difficult to use one of these cameras. Uh, uh, this camera here I plan to be listing for sale in my uh, stores tonight, so if you'd like to buy this Beautyflex or another TLR or other kind of camera, please visit one of my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. I've got more cameras coming in, more have already in fact come in, and I'll be listing those as I get them ready. So if you want to see them, uh, once again, uh, uh, please check the uh, links to my stores. And I plan to be making videos about some of these, so if you'd like to see these, uh, please subscribe. As I always say, I'm trying to get more people interested in vintage cameras and uh, film photography, and if you click the like button, that really helps. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.